Hi everyone, I'm Dave Butler. I'm Grace Freeman. Welcome to Don't Miss This. We're so happy that you're here. If you're new, this is a scripture study class. It's like jumping back into institute or seminary again. And we move through the Book of Mormon and this year, Book of Mormon. And uh, we talk about things that we think you do not want to miss. So we're so happy to be studying uh, along together every single week. We're jumping into a new book today, the Book of Jacob, which is... uh, so rad to jump into. Uh, Jacob's Nephi's little brother, and he was born out in the wilderness. And we were just talking a minute ago about how... That's not, crazy. Yeah. What a wild life that is. That he... the sto- like, And you like, forget to even imagine that. Like when you read it, you don't remember that that's his life. Like born in a caravan. Somewhere on the journey. Yeah. Right? He's never seen Jerusalem before. His older brothers probably told him about it. He's like, oh, there's this really cool this, and there's this really cool that. But he's never seen a like a city, especially of that size, that he hasn't helped create and build. Like he's just been there for ground up experience. Like it just, anyways, just a wild to even think about the yeah. kind of perspective that he might have. Um, like it's just wild to think. He's never known like a other civilization besides the one that they're creating. Like, that's just like so interesting, like the perspective that he would have on life because of that. And especially because he would have an imagination of what it would have been like from his brothers. Yeah. But how cool that then he just had this moment that he's like, okay, well, I just get to choose the life that we're going to create here. Right. We better make it good. Yeah. I don't know yeah. anything better. Yeah. True. True. Yeah. You know? Right. Um, it, P.S. If you have the tippins. Um, these are little information papers that you can slide into your margins of your scriptures. It turns your book of Mormon into a study journal. Um, there's two of these for the book of Jacob, Venus, Jerem, Omni, and Words of Mormon all together. So you can put them here at the beginning of Jacob or slide them a little bit later. They give you just an overview of what you're about to read, how many chapters, the dates, a little table of contents. Like this is what Jacob 1's about. Don't miss this in Jacob 2. Don't miss this in Jacob 7. And then people that you are going to meet throughout those chapters that are kind of key characters throughout there. So slide those in if you have the tippins. If you do not have the tippins and want the tippins, these and all the other study resources, the posters and journals and stuff are available at Desert Book for you to get and help in your study. So there is that. We're calling today the people business. This is a phrase that Grace and I have used back and forth a lot when we talk about the work of God. He introduces his work in Moses 1 and says, this is my work and my glory to bring to pass immortality and eternal life of man. Or summarize, God is in the people business. That's what he's about. He's not in the world creating business, although he did a really good job, but he created the world for his children. He's not in the law giving business, although he's done a really good job. He gave the law for his children. He's not in the miracle business, although he does a really good job. He does miracles for his children. Everything is about people for him, the building up, the sanctifying, the eventually exalting of all of his children. And I think having that perspective, we saw that verse a couple chapters ago where it says he doeth nothing Save it be good and for the benefit of the world because he loveth his children. That that's what he's all about. And I think you really see that here in this chapter because Jacob is going to be one of his errand boys. Jacob is his prophet. And so Jacob will take on the response, the work of the father and the son, and that will be people. And so everything that you can see him as a servant of God, that he's going to be doing the same, he's going to be involved in that same people business. And you can tell that he can't stop talking about it. That's Mm -hmm. how you know that someone really loves their job, I feel like, is when they can't stop talking about it and bringing it up. And you cannot read these first four chapters without being sold on the people business. Yeah. And even like, I'm just thinking ahead of time, going into Jacob chapter five, where God's going to use an allegory. And even in there, in allegory form, he's going to describe what it looks like to be in the people business also. And that's interesting. You say that you'll notice Jacob where he talks about, this is becomes really important to him because God is important to him. And God's work is important to him. And that work is people. And you can just, you see it in some of the phrases. So let's jump into this first um, section here in the beginning of Jacob chapter one, where he just gives a little bit of, this is what's going on. And I was handed the plates by my brother. And in verse two, he says, he gave me this um, commandment that I should write on them the things which I considered to be most precious. 
And that's neat to think about this being, um, we all in our house um, have little treasure boxes, you know? And that's what we call them for the kids. Like, okay, if you want to keep that, put it in your treasure box. And there's only so much room in that the treasure box. That was your box. best idea ever, just right? so you know. Yeah. And there's only so much room. Because something about me, I'm a trinket girl. So, yeah. so that's... if it can't fit, you've got to take out an old treasure, you know, and like, and you have to replace it. So this is your, this is the amount of space you can keep your treasure box in. For the record, I'm a trinket guy. And so my treasure box has expanded. I to was a... wondering that. I said, you, sorry, I'm a great. I said, you love trinkets. I know, but I don't like other people's trinkets. So I give all the kids a trinket box. I have a trinket trunk. It's in the garage. And when you're a dad and you own a house, you get a trinket shelf, you get a trinket <laughs> drawer. You, get a trinket. you have a trinket house. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. fine. That's my box. My box got bigger. <laughs> the kids can fill their house with whatever they want. But there's only so much space, he says. And so I'm going to put the, the treasures in there. My most important things I'm going to put in there. And he gives you what those are in verse 4. And he says, preaching that is sacred revelation that is great, and prophesying that I should engrave. Uh, meaning like prophesying is good enough, it's worth etching in. And so you see that that is what he wants to put, verse four. Preaching that is sacred, revelation that is great, and prophesying worth etching in. Now here's where he starts talking about people in verse five, which is interesting. And there's two words here that you want to circle. He says, because of faith and great anxiety... It truly had been made manifest to us concerning our people, what things should happen unto them. So it's interesting because a lot of times we'll talk about faith. The faith that I had led to a manifestation of the Spirit. And in Jacob's case, also his divine worry led to a manifestation of the Spirit. There's something about the divinity of worry. I think we have to balance that out and know what we're talking about when the Savior's most, second most common sermon throughout Scripture is fear not. Like he is always talking to his disciples, hey, consider the lilies of the field. I've got this. Take no concern for tomorrow. So he does have a talk about like don't let fear and anxiety paralyze you. But as every good friend And as every parent and grandparent, uncle and aunt and neighbor know, there is something, love manifests itself as worry or anxiety. And and again, balance the Lord's teachings here when we say that, but I think there's something about that my worry and concern for a person can lead to inspiration for that person. And I think one of my favorite parts about that is... I love that they're connected so closely with the word and because I also see a pattern in scripture and in my own life that the majority of the best things that have ever happened to me have come from me doing something that scared me, Mm -hmm. something that I was so afraid of, Mm -hmm. something that I was like, oh, I don't know if I'm brave enough to go and do that. And I love that he says, you have no idea what's on the other side of faith and anxiety. Mm -hmm. You have no idea how good it's going to be when finally like you're brave enough to do something and it's realized to you. And I think that's such a thrilling thought that there are things that do make us so scared and we're so afraid and we need a lot of bravery for. But I also love that he says, you can have faith and anxiety at the same time. Well, and I was just thinking, I just circled the word and in that verse five because I think maybe they they will go together. Yes. Right? Because sometimes um, someone will say the opposite of faith is, you know, the opposite doubt of fear. Or, some, yeah. or whatever, or like, or something yeah. like that. But, um, but faith is uncertainty. Faith and uncertainty will always be together at the same time. And uncertainty brings anxiety. That's what gives me the most anxiety. Right. Well, and it gives an opportunity to have faith. Right? Mm -hmm. So in order to have faith, there has to be something that I don't fully know what's going to happen. So I don't, otherwise, if I know what's going to happen, then it's it's called certainty. It's not faith anymore. So by design, there will always, a little bit of like this divine anxiety will accompany faith. They go together. They, They give opportunity you know, for each other. And your anxiety or your uncertainty does not need to disqualify you 
And mean that you cannot have faith at the same time. Yeah. I mean, you think about like Moses standing at the Red Sea. I am certain he had a, a, a trepidation and anxiety of some sort. Or Peter jumping out of the boat. And some anxiety before where you're just like, oh, For okay. Sure. In this moment of anxiety. And I think it's important, again, to balance what we said about, you know, the Lord saying, don't let that cripple you. Don't let that, you know, Ooh, which is actually really interesting because you can either do one of two paths here. If you begin with some sort of fear or anxiety, your next step is either, I will either couple that with paralyzing fear and Hmm. do nothing and expect the worst, or I will take that fear, anxiety, and I will couple it with faith and I will hope and expect for the best. So a default for mortality seems to be fear and anxiety, you know, of some kind. Now, what are you going to, what will that motivate in you? What will that, what will you couple with it? Will you couple fear with along with it or will you couple faith along with it and i think it's so interesting that i don't even know who said this and this might not even be scientifically true it's fine either way but someone was telling me that the like you the way your body reacts to fear and excitement is the exact same, same. Yeah, i've heard that too yeah so might you be guys, true if you're a scientist and you want to prove us wrong please don't let's just let us believe that yeah, for a second because okay? I, like yeah. I like it and it helps me deal with my anxiety so it's fine okay and i think that's such a cool way of living the life of a disciple is realizing yeah there's going to be moments you're going to feel anxiety are you going to let that lead you to fear or are you going to let that lead you to excitement yeah and right. i think there's a balance there obviously like there's like different kinds of anxiety but i right, love right, the right. Idea. we're using a word that like people could be translating really differently when you hear it we're not talking yeah. about medical anxiety yeah here. we're just talking about you know like little, little nerves right. the butterflies in right. your t- stomach something bigger than me yeah something that is unknown uh nevi walks into the city of jerusalem and he says i knew not beforehand the things which i should do that feeling that he has in there is i think what he's talking about anxiety and faith together yeah and he does something about it faith is that moving forward part of it whereas fear would have said we're staying in the cavity of the rock Mm. Now, what you're going to find out here is he is really, really concerned about his people. And so he's going to do something about it. He has a worry, an observation uh, about them. And I think um, what God calls him to do is go to the temple, stand on the steps of the temple and address the issue. Call it out. And FYI, um, it's, you're, you're going to get tomatoes thrown at you, you know. And so maybe there's a little bit of that. Where he's like, oh, I really don't want. Um, to do this, but that he says this, we had many revelations and the spirit of much prophecy. Prophecy you could replace with like um, hope also. A a prophecy is something a lot of times of the future. We talk about the testimony of Christ. Well, that testimony of Christ assures you of things to come. She says, because of that hope in our hearts, because of the many revelations that we had, because we knew of Christ and his kingdom, which should come, because those were a certainty, It propelled us. We had to do something. Something had to be done about it. I love a line from President Irene that he said um, something really close to this, where he just said, whenever you feel a prompting of the Holy Spirit, there's always something to be done about it. And that's what you see in verse six. We had these revelations. We had this hope embedded in our souls. Um, We knew of Christ. It was a certainty to us. And so, verse 7, we labored diligently among our people. There was no other option besides that. We knew what was at stake here. And so we had to to dig in to um, God's work and Mm -hmm. to that people business. And he said, we labored diligently to do this, to persuade them. Where he said, I wish that all of you could believe this, this one thing. Now, will you go over to the, ne- to the right and then we'll come back to this, I promise. Um, everybody, sorry, I put this a little bit out of order, but our word for the week is, is to persuade. I love thinking about this and it comes from this verse that's here, especially the question like, what do I, we're gonna learn a list of what Jacob wishes to persuade people in. Um, and I, and here's the Webster's definition, which is at the bottom of all of these to incline to the will to a determination to convince by reasons suggested by reflection or deliberation. Mm. Let me get, I, I, I want to convince you. I want to incline you to a different kind of determination. I want you to think about this. I want you to think about the reasons behind here and let me, I, I really want to persuade you to something. Well, and I think that's such an interesting thing by reason suggested by reflection or deliberation because you only persuade someone or convince someone if you are so 
passionate about it if yeah. you're so convinced already about it and i love that this isn't coming from a place of like hey i heard this is a good idea but it's coming from a place that's like no i've reflected on what this has done for me mm-hmm. i have seen what has happened in my life because of this and i will do whatever it takes for you to experience this because i have seen what it do- has done for me yeah right and i love thinking about this list that he's about to give and what reasons he might give to persuade you to do something like that. And that could actually be a a cool cool. discussion. So let's look at the list. And this is, you can write, this this is the list that you found in your journal here too. But these are in verses seven through eight. And number one, you might number them, you know, in your um, verses, like scriptures, Um, come unto Christ. So example, like why might he want, what are his reasons why that would be a good idea? What might Jacob say? that that might be a good idea. What might you say would be a good idea to come closer to Christ? And, and I, would, I would couch that in a relationship kind of, when we say come under Christ, I think it means like, oh, we've, we've, um, we, talk, we talk with each other, we trust each other. I, I looked at, you know, yeah. there's a lot of things that you could. Um, number two, partake of his goodness. I, per- persuade me, sell me on his goodness. Right well, and here. even that one's so cool to think about what we know about Jacob's life and why would he tell you to partake of his goodness? And it's so cool to think back on his life and be like, you know what? He had to look at, he had to look and find the goodness. And it probably wouldn't have been easy growing up in the entire wilderness, yeah. camping every single day. That is my biggest nightmare of my life. And I love when it's like, <laughs> It's not my whole life, you guys. Okay, I like to camp sometimes, but I don't want to live in the campground, okay? And I love that he's like, no, listen, I've seen what it has done for me to experience his goodness in my life. I've seen how it has changed my life and my perspective. Jacob might even say, I've lived off his goodness. I yeah. survived off of his goodness. So it's so cool. That would be, I will do that in my class for sure, I think, is go through these and why would someone persuade right. you? What yeah. is the reason behind them wanting you to do this. I think that'd be so cool. That was such yeah. a good idea. Enter into his rest. I, I'm so intrigued by this study. Uh, I said a study because you could take a study of his rest and what that mm. uh, and what that actually looks like and means. If you, th- That would be a really cool cross scripture study of what it means to enter into his rest. The temple is a symbol of entering into his rest, but it's a symbol of a reality that you could experience right now. What does it look like to live in a wilderness place and still enter into his rest. Remember, the tabernacle was set up in the wilderness, which was a symbol to the people that said, in this wilderness place, in a time of journeying, before you've reached the destination, you can still experience his rest. Mm. So uh, don't rebel not. And and whoa, whoa, these could all be really, really interesting conversations. Believe, he says. Um, I'm really intrigued by number six. On here, found in verse eight, where he says, "I want to persuade people to view his death," um, and and I've translated this into my own life, uh, you know, to as that as the, that moment on the cross. View his. We just celebrated Easter week, depending on when you watch this video, and to view his death and the message of what his death teaches about how he feels about you, how he feels about the world. Mm. Um, there's something about viewing his death. It's like that's a picture of love. There's something about viewing his death that says uh, it humbles you, which he's going to call for in the next chapter when he says, when you view his death, you realize how serious your sin is, was. Um, You might say to yourself, as um, a favorite pastor of mine once said, I didn't know I cost that much. And it humbles you. But at the same time, it exalts you because you would look at, view his death and you would say, I didn't know someone could love me that much. I didn't think I was that lovable. And so it, it, it's a, there is just so much that happens as we um, consider the cross. And then that last one where he says, I want to persuade people interestingly to suffer his cross and bear the shame of the world. He's calling you into the people business on that last one. And that might be a, that might be a tougher sell, you know, um, to persuade somebody to do that. But what a, what a beautiful um, conversation that could be. Um, to talk with somebody who has carried the cross, you know, who has suffered the shame of this world in the name of Jesus. Someone like, you know, Paul would be someone great to interview. But man, I would love to just um, talk to somebody who has, because his cross was his work. His cross was his burden, but it, it was his burden. It was a burden of love. It was a work of love. 
And so it's like, Jacob seems to be saying, oh, um, take, um, Jesus's love to me is a sacrificial love. It's like what it means to love like Jesus is, um, to, is to experience pain, is to experience loss, is to experience hard things for the benefit of somebody else. And so there's something about him calling you into that. And it would be awesome to say, persuade me to do the work of Jesus because the work of Jesus, Jesus can be lonely. And the work of Jesus can be heartbreaking. And I say to Jack and to my missionary boys, you know, my little crew of boys every single week, your life could probably be so much easier if you were not out there as a missionary. Your life could be so much easier if you didn't care so much about your next door neighbor. Your life could be so much easier if you didn't love your kids as much as you do. Hmm. Like that's what it looks like to carry the cross and to suffer the, the shame of, of the world. Where could, the easier thing is just be like, I will dismiss this. But like Jacob says, after all we've felt and after all we've known, we can't dismiss it. So we labor diligently to persuade people, you know, to do this. These other, you know, six are just almost like, oh, come, come experience the goodness of it. And then this very last one says, uh, join the team, get off the bench, essentially come, you know, take, take, carry the work of discipleship on your back is, uh is what he's calling you into. And wouldn't you want to hear somebody who says, why do you, why do you do that? Why would you, why would you ever do that? Give me the benefits. And I just don't think it's an accident that that one's last on the list. Oh no. You know? Yeah. That, Explain I think why. That is because such a beautiful so good lesson that all of a sudden he's going to say, listen, I, before I even ask you to be a part of the business with me, I want you to see what it feels like to be a part of it. I want mm-hmm. you to know him before I ask you to join him. Yeah. That's such a pattern for learning. Yeah. Especially spiritually. Yeah. Because you could, you could ask Jesus himself, you know, why would you have done that? Mm-hmm. There was what, why would you have spent your life the way you spent it? Why did you end your life the way you ended it? Why would you have ever done something like that? You were, you, were, you were on a throne in heaven. Why did you ever, ever come down? What was the benefit? And I love in Hebrews when it says, for the joy that was set before him, you know? Because I think if you ask Jesus, why would you ever do something like that? He would say, you, for you. That's why I did it, hmm. you know? And so there's something that's just so beautiful there. Because then, then it's like, oh, why would we even do this? Oh, because of him. Yeah. That's such an easy switch. Amen. That's, yeah, that's a big task to bear, but... Not as big as his for us. Yeah. And as you get into the, the next column of verses there, I just want to point out how neat it is in verse 10. Oh, yeah, good. Where he just says, they talk about Nephi, how much they loved him. He died and he was so well loved. And you find out why in verse 10. He says, oh, because he defended us and he lived, labored all his days for our welfare. That's why he was so admired. That's why we will name every single one of our kings after him from now on. Because all he did is worked to defend us and worked for our welfare. That's how he lived out his life. And so every king, I want them to take on that title when, and when they receive that title. And thinking about that, how that pattern that they take in their political system, it's like, oh, our next king's gonna be Nephi because this is what the name Nephi now stands for. It stands for a defender hmm. and it stands for someone who works for the blessing of others. And I think about how neat that is that at baptism, we all take on that name of Christ at baptism because, oh, I'm going to take on the name and the work of Christ. I'm going to take on, I'm going to be a defender of others and I'm going to work for the blessing and welfare of others. That's what I'm going to do. It happens in in, in a priesthood ordination as well, where um, somebody, you know, um, receives the Melchizedek priesthood and that name Melchizedek means, Melchizedek means king of righteousness. When Jack received the Melchizedek priesthood, I said to him, I was like, who, who, if I said, fill in the blank, who's the king of righteousness? The easy answer is Jesus. And I said, okay, go be a king. He's calling you to be a king of righteousness, to oversee a little kingdom, Mm -hmm. whatever your circle of influence is, the same way Jesus would oversee a circle of, of righteousness also. And, uh, um, and that's just not unique to a man receiving the Melchizedek priesthood, you know? We learn that in the temple that we're called to a, a work of kings and queens and priests and priestesses. 
mm-hmm. and a baptism too. Anyways, to take on the name of Christ in the temple means take on his work. Take on the people business. Join take on, Yeah. There's a reason a temple looks like a castle, mm-hmm. right? You have a little kingdom, a little sphere of influence, right? Anyways, um, we went. We had a lot to say. <laughs> we loved day one. About Jacob we loved day one, and now I just want to think about a kingdom so bad. And why is that? There's more. There's more. It's coming. It's just, There's more stuff coming. It's fine, everyone. Okay. We had to, we go, had to go back order. to that Sorry, paper. Everyone. Now, okay. Here we go. Next. The next day's section. reading is Jacob 1, 13 through 19, and we're calling it Running Errands. And before, when I was reading this like little section, as my study, I remember this one conversation I had on my mission. And one of my, um, I lived with all these different sisters. And one of the sisters that I lived with, her brother was trying to decide to go on a mission. And he emailed her. And the entire email was just one question. And it was so simple. And it said, what does it feel like to go to sleep as a missionary? And Stop. I know, so why awesome. is that the best question ever? And we seriously talked about it for so, so long. Because I think it struck like a particular chord in my heart because I had experienced what it felt like to go to bed not as a missionary. And the year before I left on my mission, I remember so many nights I would lay in my bed and I'd just think, what am I even doing with my life? And why am I feel like, why do I feel so lonely at night and so anxious at night? And these feelings that like would keep me up and I just couldn't figure it out the year before my mission. And that was a really, like out of all my day, nighttime was the hardest for me. And I felt like, empty when I would like lay down and go to sleep. I was just like, what am I missing in my life? And so when she asked that question, like, what does it feel like for you guys to go to sleep as a missionary? It really hit me because I was like, oh, it feels so different than my life that I knew before. Mm. And I started thinking and I was like, oh, what does it feel like to like go to bed as a missionary? Like, I remember so many nights on my mission that I would just lay in my bed and I couldn't even fall asleep because my smile was too big and so my face couldn't relax to go to sleep because I was just so happy that That's I was so just cute. like looking like a kid before like Disneyland. Christmas yeah, Disneyland. So it's like I was just grinning and you can't sleep if you're grinning. And then I thought about the other nights and I'm like, I don't even remember what it feels like to go to sleep because I didn't even Flopped know I was asleep. Down. Yeah, like, I was like, I just woke up again and the alarm went off and I was like back and I was so tired. And I went through all these different emotions that you feel as a missionary and the nights that you're like lying awake not because like you're feeling sad about your life but because you're thinking about the people that you're going to see the next day Mm. and how you can help them a little bit more and what's going to happen in um this little section of reading is you're going to be introduced to like jacob's call he calls it his errand and it starts right in like verse 17, wherefore I, Jacob, gave unto them these words as I taught them in the temple, having first obtained my errand from the Lord. He had gotten a call from the Lord to do something, to step into a bigger life. He had met the Lord, loved him enough, and then he said, okay, I want to be a part of the people business. Give me some errands to do. What do you need from me? Excuse me, I now want to write down whatever you just said. Step into a bigger life. I just uh, already now have to go and watch our own podcast <laughs> so that I can go back and like, I want to write down what you just said. Oh my God. Because gosh. isn't that so exciting? It's so awesome. Yeah. And then what's going to happen is he's going to describe his days to you and he's going to say, listen, We are going to do a lot and it is going to be a busy life. And I think that happens no matter what life you're stepping into, the bigger calling, the bigger life. That's going to change the way you live your day to day. Your 9 to 5 is going to actually be a 7 to 11 p.m. at night and it's going to take a lot out of you probably. And he's going to describe it. He says in verse 19, and we did magnify our office unto the Lord, taking upon us the responsibility. First of all, already that sentence, taking upon us the responsibility. He said, I know I will take this on. This is going to be big. It's going to feel like a lot of responsibility. I will take that on my shoulders. You can feel that sentence on your shoulders. When you take on something, it's okay, here we go. Let's get into it. Answering the sins of the people upon our own heads if we did not teach them the word of God with all diligence. He says, I will work so hard. I will be so diligent. I will give everything I have to this. And just so you know, I will do it all and I will give 
every part of me because like, and if I don't, like I will take upon the sins of them because like I want to do everything I can. Which I think is not like in actuality, right? No, this no, is, no. Uh, that's not is, his job. Yeah, that's not he, his error. That was Jesus's. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So sometimes we read this and there are people who read these things and they, you know, and, and it's like, this is a fear-based kind of like, yeah. You're like, like, whoa. Yeah. Where you're just like, oh my gosh, if I don't, if I don't say what I was supposed to say, like then their sins are on me. No, 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 no. That's like you said. So that was perfect to say. That's Jesus's job. He's saying this like, um, what, what do you call it when you kind of exaggerate when you speak a little bit, you know? I think that's like, how you call it. Yeah. <laughs> so, you could just call it exactly. There's a word for it, you guys. We will find it at the thesaurus after. You don't have to email me. But um, it's like the, the, I, just this idea of like, that's how, this is how seriously I'm going to take it as if I'm answering for your sins myself. And I think the reason that it feels safe to me is you have to, and I think the next sentence helps too, is wherefore by laboring with our might, their blood might not come upon our garments. There's something to me that when you hear that, it either sounds like fear or it sounds like love. Mm. And to me, that screams, I will do anything I can for the people that I love. Yeah. Whatever it takes, I will work with all my diligence and I will labor with all my might because I love them. Yeah. And I will do whatever it takes. To me, that is like him just being like, listen, like I love you so much, I will give everything I have to you. Yeah. I will dedicate my entire life to the people business. I will do it. And I will do it to the very best and most that I possibly can. And to me, when I read that, it just made me want to think like, oh, I wonder what it felt like for Jacob to go to sleep at night. Mm. And I think that there were probably days that he didn't even remember falling asleep because he was so tired because it took so much out of him. And I think that there were probably days that he like laid in his bed and he was smiling so big that he couldn't close his eyes because his smile was too big and he couldn't sleep because he was so happy. And I think that there were probably days for him that he was up later than he should have been because he was so worried about how to help more. Yeah. And I think that that's what it looks like to labor diligently. I think that you know if you're laboring diligently, you know if you're giving it your all when you go to bed at night. Hmm. that's when you feel it the very most. Hmm. And the thing about it is that stepping into the people business and giving it your all does look like nights that you can't sleep because you're so worried. And it does look like nights that you think, I can't do this. I can't even wake up tomorrow. I like, I like, let me sleep through the whole entire day because I'm so tired. And it looks like not even realizing you fell asleep because you were so tired or even falling asleep on your knees next to your bed because you don't have the strength to get back into your bed. But it also looks like the days that you go to bed and you can't even sleep because you're smiling or you're giggling or you say, I just have to like stay up 15 more minutes so I can tell you about the miracles that happened in my day. Mm -hmm. And that's laboring diligently. And the second you start experiencing that, you realize that it is difficult and it is hard and it is a big weight to carry, but you do not carry it on your own. And the person that you're carrying that weight with makes it worth it. Yeah. Every single time. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're going to find a scripture a little bit later where Jesus will, um, will he, he will talk about, I po I'll point out your weaknesses so that you'll come unto me and we can spend time with each other. That's going to come a little bit later. But I'm thinking right now, you're going to say, oh, if you want to spend your days with Jesus, be in the work of Jesus. It's like, you know, I'm going to find him best in the places where he's most often going to be. You know, remember Mary and... When she's looking for baby Jesus, or kid Jesus. <laughs> it's fine. She didn't lose the baby, everyone. She wasn't that bad of a mom. Come on, back off. But when um, she loses Jesus, she goes to the temple to find him. And then she's like, oh, it just feels like that's where he's going to be. He's going to be in a place like that. Mm -hmm. um, because of, you know, he's going to be in a place where he's answering people's questions. Or he's going to be helping people out. So if you want to find Jesus, you want to spend your day with Jesus... Go be in the work that's most likely going to be his kind of work, you know? And, and I think it's just interesting that like that, there's a lot of symbolism there, you know, with blood on their, on their garments um, that has to do with the day of atonement mm -hmm. in the temple where a high priest would take in the sacrificial animal into the Holy of Holies. Um, that's, there's so much Jesus symbolism in that. It's like, oh, you'll there's a reason Jesus says carry the cross, right? He's just like, oh, there is a... Caring is difficult. And as you were describing that, it just made me think about that, you know, that picture of Jesus in Gethsemane might be 
the the image of Jesus that you um, look to for you know your support and help where he calls out and he says, I don't know if I can do this. Mm. I, this is too hard for me to do, but nevertheless, I will. I'll do it. If this is the cost of rescue, then I'm then I'm going to do it. You know? And for any of you friends or moms or dads or grandmas, grandpas out there, teachers, you know, who feel exhausted in the cause of Christ, you know, your prayer might reflect something similar where it's like, um, I, I, this is so heavy, Father, to carry, to, to do, but, but I'll do it and, and expect his help and expect his, his angels like you saw in Gethsemane as well. Um, I had a friend growing up and her mom would always have like errands all day. She would just do errands. I don't know. Like, and I don't need, she, I know she did more than that, but in my head all day, all she did was errands. It's like what moms do. Yeah. I'm like, like, what, like errands. where are you running errands? Yeah. <laughs> that's <laughs> it's so funny that answer. you just say that because like, as, <laughs> as a kid, you don't even know what it means. No, I, like, I remember thinking that. And I was like, like, what's errands? Yeah. And I'm like, that's a good life. I'm like, just running errands. I was like, that seems so fun. And I remember thinking that every mom is like, it's not fun. And I see you now and I know running errands. But I remember always like we would go over to their house and she'd be like, oh, I'm just about to run errands. And I always wanted to go. Like I was like, let me come. I'm like, please, can I? And anytime you went, you knew that she was going to take you somewhere good. That was the thing about her errands is that it was always really fun places. Really like, there was like some mundane things, of course, too, but it was always something that I wanted to be a part of. And because the post office is fun when you're a kid. Yes, you know? yeah. You're like 12, <laughs> when you're like, you grow okay. Up and yeah. You hate the post office <laughs> to the line, but like everything is fun. Yeah, <laughs> and you'd always make it worth it. Like there was always gonna be like an ice cream sundae at McDonald's on the way home. Or there was always gonna be like, oh, let's go to the DI and like find like really fun like trinkets or something. You know, I'm a trinket girl. And like take that home. And like she always made the errands worth it. And me and David were talking at the beginning before we even started recording. And he was like, oh, don't you feel like God has an errands list? And I think that his errands list doesn't look like the post office and like going to like the DI. But I think that for God, his errand list just looks like a list of people. Mm -hmm. And he wakes up and he says, this is what I'm going to do today. And I love that. I think that we have the chance to say, oh, can I come with you? Mm. on your errands? Mm. Can I be a part of your errands? And I think it's the same thing as the mom of my friend that I grew up with. I think his answer would back would always be in yes, for sure. And I will make it worth it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I just, I have this, we have a friend, um, Laurel, and she, I remember her teaching this one time and just talking about like imagining a council in heaven of God and the angels all together and then looking at the errand list and, uh, and seeing a name on there and someone that needed to be helped and someone that needed to be loved and someone that needed to be cared for. Um, and, and she just said, I just love imagining the father saying to all the angels there, oh, none of you worry. I have a daughter who's going to take care of this. And just being the kind of person that is willing to, to carry the, the load of care for, for somebody else. Just being the kind of person that God knows he can say to his angels, don't worry, I have a son, I have a daughter that lives right down the street and they will take care of this for me because I will send them on an errand. And, and I, you know, in your little f- flip pad um, thing, I love the call to action on that one, obtain your errand, you know, to start a day and say, do you want a fulfilling life? Do you want rich experiences? Do you want to fill your calendar and your journals with treasures? Then begin your day asking the Father to send you on an errand and then listen for it and watch for it until the sun sets that night and even after. And uh, that will be the kind of life um, that leaves you grinning when you try to go to bed. Mm. That's also our tender mercy. Hurry, we almost oh, forgot. That's our tender mercy. Good job. The Grace. chance to be a part of his errands. Yeah. So my errand from the Lord, you can put it on your poster. You can stick it in. It Some people, I think, are sticking it in their scriptures. Scriptures, which like I almost think so as cute. extra tippins, you know, printing them out. But there's your tender mercy for the day. That's cool that the tender mercy is you get a chance to be the errand. sent on an errand. Mm-hmm. Okay, you guys, we'll move a little quicker to the yeah, next we have couple to be sections. Fast. Um, cause we're only on chapter two, Yikes. <laughs> you might be having faith and anxiety that you're going to be listening for, for five hours. Yeah. um, 
I, again, you can come back to him. We said at the beginning, verse three is another example of that. Verse two and three, I want to magnify my office with soberness. I'm going back to verse one because look at what I, I wrote in my journals. Like, I mean, in my scriptures, I was writing like, okay, this is what I spoke after the death of Nephi. And I was like, at first I was like, you already said that. <laughs> Why are you pointing out again? It feels like it's on the mind. And then right after he says, I want to magnify my office. I want, I want to labor. It's almost like he's well, being inspired so cool. by him. He's like, I'm remembering, man, I... I can step up. Yeah, it's like walking out of a, walking out of a funeral. And you're just like, you know when you leave a funeral and you just say, I, I gotta be better. I want to live a... I want to live a little bit more I like live a be- Yeah, I want to live a better life. I, I went to a good dear friend's funeral and his daughter spoke. Um, and she just, she described her father and said... Um, when she was talking about how do you wrap up, like speak about the life of one of your heroes in seven minutes or, or you know, the time you have at a funeral. And she said, my father was a father who knocked. And then she talked about mm. just how he'd come to her room and knock on the door. And um, anytime that she was, you know, ask her, what do you need? Anyways, it was so tender, it was so sweet. And she compared it to father in heaven who knocks at the door in, in Revelation, you know, at the end. And I seriously left that funeral and I went straight to the elementary school and I picked up my two sons to take them for ice cream somewhere. Because I left that funeral and I was like, I want to be a dad who knocks. I want one who's involved, one who comes into your life and says, I, do you know what I mean? And it shows says, up at your door. Yeah, it shows up at your door. And it feels like Jacob's feeling that. And he says, I'm, I'm feeling the office of my calling, the, the diligence in verse three. And I want to do much more. And, and, and he says this in verse five, and we're co- this is going to come back. Some of you listening are going to have a task ahead of you that cannot be done in verse five without the help of the all powerful creator of heaven and earth. <laughs> like <laughs> that so shows real. you the intensity <laughs> of how big this is for him. He's like, I don't just need the help of Jesus. I need the help of the all powerful creator of <laughs> heaven and earth. This is a red sea in front of me. And, and, and he just talks about the grief he has for this job. And verse six and seven, he's just like, oh, I hate that I have to call out your sin. It feels like an oncologist who has to walk into the waiting room, I mean, into the room and say, I'm so sorry you have this that needs to be cut out of you. Like, I hate to be the bearer of um, that news. Um, or, or, Or we're just having general conference right now, and it makes me just have such a deep appreciation for the sermon someone doesn't want to give or the conversation a mother doesn't want to have or the text the friend doesn't want to send because it will be uncomfortable to do it. And um, this is not giving you license to bring up stuff at Thanksgiving dinner, um, but it is like it endears my heart to people who take on you know, and say the things that nobody wants to say because of how deeply they love. So I thank God for brave and courageous people like that, for prophets and leaders who um, give their time away from grandkids and great grandkids and baseball tournaments and, and missionaries who leave and miss time at home and, and, and just Everybody who takes in the people business, especially the uncomfortable parts of it, I just pay you tribute for that. And he says, notwithstanding, verse 10, the greatness of the task, I must. I just, hmm. to have that feeling in his heart. And, and God promises in verse 11, I shall give thee. He's t- I just, will you underline that phrase in 11? That's, that's a promise to anyone who has a task in front of them. Those four words of promise from the Lord, I shall give thee. The word, the, the energy, the courage, the faith, whatever it is there, is, there is a promise there. And the kind of issue that the people have, um, he had, they have two, and I'll talk about one, and Grace will talk about the other. Um, he says, the worst one is Grace's one. So this is payback <laughs> from that last week. You have to have all the sad ones, and I have the worst one. <laughs> He says, um, a problem that I'm seeing, end of verse 13 is, um, well, here's not a problem. That God smiled upon you and you've obtained a lot of riches and you've obtained them abundantly. That's not a problem. Um, That's a blessing. 
The problem is that you now think that you um, are better than they. End of 13. That's the problem. You think you're better than other people. And it's reflected in the way that you think, in the way that you speak, and in the way that you act. And he said, can I give you um, the, di- the what, what's the solution, you know, to that? One, just will you think for a second how small you are compared to God. <laughs> you're not as big a deal as you think you are. Go up into a mountain. Look, go into the ocean. See how small you are. That's a remedy to it. He says, let that, um, don't let the pride of your heart destroy your soul. This is so dangerous of a cancer to think that you're better than other people um, in verse 16. And he says, can I give you a call to action? 17, think of your brethren like unto yourselves. Love other people, the golden rule. Love people the way you wish people would love you. Give the gifts you wish people would give you. Treat other people the same way you wish other people would treat treat you. And look at these two things, a way to do that. Be familiar with all. Get to know other people. Hear their stories. You might accidentally th- think you're better than someone because they become, they become an object to you. Find out their emotions. Find out their worries. Find out their concerns. Step into uh, stories. Don't just write a check, although sometimes write a check. But, you know, come to know people mm-hmm. is, is such a sweet call. And be free with your substance that they might be rich like you. Make other people rich like you, he says. And then there's this line, before you seek for riches, seek for the kingdom of God. Will you always and forever, maybe in your margins, write down next this kingdom of God equals people. Because God is a king. And Heavenly Mother is a queen. And kings and queens rule over some sort of dominion. And it's like, well, what's their dominion? It's their family. The government of the universe is a family. And it's ruled over by a king and a queen. Or rather, and better stated, it's ruled over by a father and a mother. Their kingdom is children. It's people. Kingdom of God. Make that synonymous with people. And Jacob says, seek this first. Seek people and the welfare of people first and and that get that get that priority straight and everything else seems to work out mm. beautiful the next day's reading is jacob 2 19 through 35 and it is just like picking up exactly where david left off and i think that before you get into the solution i think you need to see the state of the world that they were living in and i think that that like, that's, the, that's true with everything. You don't want the solution unless you know there's a problem. And so I think it's, like, we're going to start at the end of this chapter, and then we're going to go back to the very beginning of our reading, just because I think that you don't care about the solution unless you realize what the problem is. And for these people, David brought up one of the problems, and it's pride, but not even just that, but it's how they were treating people. Right. And it's what the pride led them to do to other people that was hurting them. But there was another problem, and it was chastity, and them having so many wives and concubines, and you go through. And it's interesting because Jacob doesn't, like, he says the problem is the wives and the concubines, but then he's going to go deeper, and he's going to say, let me tell you why that is a disaster. Let me tell you what that's doing to our kingdom. Let me tell you what that's doing to God's people. And he's going to say the same thing for the pride. He's going to say, do you realize, like in verse number 20, he's going to say, your neighbors are afflicted and they are persecuted. What the? Your neighbors are afflicted and they are persecuted because of your heart right now. You are hurting your next door neighbor. You are hurting the kingdom. And then he's going to go through. And it's interesting. Can I just like throw out there that verse that I love so much that I didn't even include that 19 where he says, you know, after you, if you are seeking about people, riches will come because you want them for the intent to do good. In verse mm. 19, to clothe the naked, feed the hungry, liberate the captive, administer relief to the sick and afflicted. And as you were saying, he's like, you're using them opposite of why I gave them to you. I gave them to you to like heal the world and you're using them to cause more wounds 
And that is, that's the problem. That's the you're, big you, issue. It's opposite of how, why I, what, you know, you're doing an opposite errand. Yeah, and like, <laughs> an opposite <laughs> errand, true. And that, like, verse 20 already hurts your heart when you see the state of the kingdom of God in that moment, that everyone is afflicted and persecuted, and it's just your neighbor, like, that's who's getting so hurt. But the more you go through this chapter, you see that, like, that's one of the problems, but the more you hear about the state of this people, your heart is going to break more. And you go through and you see in verse 31, For behold, I, the Lord, have seen the sorrow and heard the mourning of the daughters. Like, do you know, like, you think you're just, like, having a good time with all these, like, oh, like wives and concubines and everything you're doing? Like, you forgot that, like, my daughters are mourning. My daughters are living in sorrow right now. That's the state of the kingdom. And the more you look, like in verse number 32, and I will not suffer, say the Lord of hosts, that the cries of the fair daughters of this people shall come unto me against the men of my... He's like, do you realize that like these people are sitting at home crying? They are like, I hear their cries and I have to do something about that. That's why Jacob, you have to give this hard sermon is because I'm in heaven and all I can hear is the cries of my daughters. And then he's going to go through and it's like, wait, this part is so, for the verse 33, for you cannot lead away captive the daughters of my people because of their tenderness. He's like, do you know that I see their tender hearts and you're trying to take advantage of their tenderness, but that is what I want to save. That's what I want to protect. Verse 35, you hear it again. Their hearts are sobbing and I hear that. Mm. Like it's one thing for your eyes to be crying. It's another for your heart to mm. be crying. Mm. And then at the end of that one, just so you know, um, many hearts died pierced with deep wounds mm. that's not like you're not just like kind of like causing a little bit of issues you are breaking people's hearts and that's why god said listen jacob you need to step in mm -hmm. you need to call them to something bigger and i love that at the very beginning of that he's gonna say and i think this has to do with pride but i also think that it has to do with the chastity issue as well that he says listen you forgot just do good I have given you blessings. I have helped you out so that you can do good. And if you just lived your life trying to clothe the naked and feed the hungry and liberate the captive and administer relief to the sick and afflicted, everything else would be taken care of. It would fix. Yeah. And I can hear the crying and I can hear the sorrow and I'm going to send someone to help you realize what you are doing to these people's hearts. But I need you to step into the people business and be better. Mm-hmm. Because that's it. Like that, yeah. It's like you're hurting real life people. Yeah. And come back to that verse too. Be familiar with all and free with your substance. Like he's giving the, you know, the, hear people's stories. See people as people. Yes. See their emotions. See their feelings. See their fears. See their worries. Right? Don't treat them as objects because they're, they're different than you are. And, and where's that line you said earlier? There's just like 23, excuse, where, or no, where's that one? You what showed me like, excuse themselves. Oh, in verse 23, I forgot about that part. Yeah. And that's so interesting because that's their like, you're gonna do all of these terrible things and then you're gonna seek to excuse yourself. Versus seek to build the kingdom, mm -hmm. right? Like he says, you're seeking to excuse yourself, justify yourself. I, I want you to seek to be liberal with your goodness. Like let that, don't try and leave with a clean slate. Like try to leave having bettered the world around you mm. and people around you. Uh, chapter three, you're gonna see a lot of similar words in there, um, but there's just one thing at the beginning I wanna focus on. The rest of the chapter, uh, the second half of the chapter, you're going to see that he's going to really talk about, uh, <laughs> you're going to, this is why we, you know, we're better than people. This is, and he's just like, stop, stop, get rid of all that kind of thinking. But I want to lean into the beginning of the chapter where he just talks about something that I like to call living vertically, um, where you are receiving your um, value, your worth, your errands, your intentions from heaven. You're not getting it necessarily from the people around you. To live vertically means to live with your eye and your heart and your hopes on God and his purposes versus some of those things. Now, what's interesting is when, when you live vertically, God will point you horizontally. 
right? But the only reason I want to be looking to my left and my right is for opportunities to love. That is what I want to be mm-hmm. looking horizontally for. But to live vertically, the, the worksheet and the journal is a great place to take notes um, on this as just like a personal um, note taking about what these things kind of mean. There's lines on here to, where Jacob gives you what it looks like to live vertically. Um, and so it's a great place to kind of like, Two things. One, write out some of your thoughts on like, okay, wh- like just expand like what that might mean. And then second, how might you do that? What, what might that look like in, on a Wednesday afternoon to do some of the things that he says? But let me show you what he says in verse one. He says, I would speak unto you who are pure in heart. He says, and here's where, um, starting with number one, look unto God. So you see right here in the worksheet, it says, look. What does that look like, you know, to look unto God? That sounds like a metaphor and you're like, okay, but what is that actually? That maybe means like look to him with your questions. Look to him for your guidance. Um, It looks like prayer. It looks like meditation. It looks like reflection. It looks like scripture reading. You're looking to his example, right? Those might be some of the things that you would write in that first square. Uh, He says, with firmness of mind, with determination, with um, diligence, with intention. Um, Number two, he says, pray unto him with exceeding faith, right? What does that look like to pray? What's that look like to pray with exceeding faith, with trust, with a willingness to act? Um, He will console you in your afflictions. He will plead your cause. He will send down justice and make things right. He's speaking, Jacob's speaking to those who've been hurt. He called out the perpetrators in chapter two, and now he's talking to the victims in chapter three. And he says, look unto God with firmness of mind. Set your heart and your sight on him. Pray with exceeding faith. And number two, he just says, lift up your heads. What's that look like to like, um, to live in hope, you might need to be reminded of some of the promises. You might need to be reminded of some of what God's able to do. You might need to read the stories of healing, how God reaches the outsiders and the outcasts. Like lift up your head, live in, live in hope, live in um, the reassurance of promises to come receive the pleasing word of God. I love that word pleasing word of his, right? Um, Like believe it. To receive it means to say like, yes, he's talking about me. I'm going to take that in. I'm going to live as if it's true. Feast upon his love. What's that look like? That is the best. I mean, this is like so awesome to be a personal journal, but even cooler, I think, to be a discussion because of just how differently people hear words to just like take this into it. And and what what do you, what is that? What do you think that means? Especially because how cool like feast on his love that a feast is never ending. A feast comes with so many different options. A feast, like you could unpack that for 15 minutes in your class. Right. And what's that mean to feast on his love? Yeah. How do I, you know, that that's a metaphor to eat his love. You know, it's like, what's that mean? Yeah. What's that mean? Feast and, oh, and just even saying that brings so much richness to the sacrament right now. That I, that it literally, you Hmm. feast on the symbols of his love. I gave my body and my blood for you, right? And just, anyways, a lot that is there. And then I just love that if your minds are firm forever, to be firm in that, to not let your mind waver to doubt and to disbelief, to set it on God's intentions for you and what God has spoken about you. Be firm in that belief of what he can do, of what he does, what he has done, what he promises to do. Be firm in that. Don't don't let um, your own thoughts or the adversary's temptations let you waver from that certainty. You know, so there's something that, anyway, this would be really, really cool personally or together as a, as a family, a group, friends to just unpack what it looks like to live with your eye on heaven. And I think the reason this calls so much to my heart is because 
it, we have never lived in a world that's easier to look to each other's neighbors. Like it's never been easier to look at other people's lives and compare because mm-hmm. you have their entire life on your phone. Like you can just, no problem, right. look up their right. entire life. And I think that would be a really cool conversation as well to bring in like, okay, well, what's the problem with looking around? What does that lead to? Why is that problematic? How does that make you feel when all you're doing is like scrolling on Instagram and you're like living in their world? Like what is the purpose of that? And I think that's such a cool way to leave this lesson is to say like, okay, like next time that you're on your phone and you're looking around you or next time you're in the school hallway and your like eyes are wandering at everyone around you, what's one of these things that you could do that like you can just like train your mind? You know, Mm -hmm. that it's like, oh, like instantly when he was talking and I was like thinking about that and like my life and like, okay, where am I looking around and how could I stop doing that? I was like, okay, next time I'm doing that, maybe you're like, I just want to pray a little bit. Or maybe you want to change your screensaver so you look at something that reminds you of him. Or maybe you want to like feast on his love and you just want to start like making a list in your mind of all the ways that he's made you feel loved that day. And I think that's such a cool way of like, let me experience looking at him instead of looking at others. Yeah. How could yeah. that change my day? Do I have a promise scripture? Like one of his words that he's spoken. Is there something? In fact, can you link chapter three, footnote it over to chapter two, verses eight and nine? Um, maybe seven, eight and nine, but, or yeah, mostly eight and nine, where I think it's so powerful that he says, some of you came here to hear the pleasing word of God. There's, there are the words of God that will please you when you hear them. And also they heal the wounded soul. Mm -hmm. That is thrilling to me to imagine that the words of God have the power and ability to heal a wounded soul. There, there's a lot of hurt. And there's a lot of harm done in this world to people. There's a lot of you who are living wounded. You are living as the walking dead, essentially, because your heart is broken underneath what nobody else can see. Obviously, there is like professional help that needs to be, you know, found for some sort of healing and hurt that is done. But it is also thrilling to imagine and to know that the word of God spoken in scripture, spoken by inspiration, spoken in blessing, um, mm-hmm. has the ability and power to heal a wounded heart. So there's, don't forget the, the beauty and the virtue and the value of, of, of the word of, word of God and those that are recorded. And, and what an opportunity that all of us have to share the word of God with others Um, with the intention of the healing that could come. Beautiful. The last reading for the week is Jacob 4. And one thing that I love about Jacob 4 is that it just feels like he's saying, listen, let's not overcomplicate things. Mm. And he goes through, it's like four things that I feel like we are so easy to overcomplicate and he makes them so simply beautiful. And the first one that I instantly see is in verse number five. And it's going to go through and he's going to start talking and they believed in Christ and worshiped the father and in his name. And also we worship the father in his name. And for this intent, we keep the law of Moses. And I think that as humans, we are really good at overcomplicating the purpose of commandments. Mm -hmm. And in one verse, he has given you the reason for commandments. And I have circled that like middle line right there. It pointing our souls to him like a million times, because I think that maybe when we think about commandments, that should be our first thought. Why do you have the word of wisdom? Why do you have the law of chastity? Why do you go to church on Sunday? Why do you always feel like you need to do this? Fill in the blank with whatever you want. And I just love that he's like, the answer is simple because it points my soul to him. I don't care what other reason. I don't feel like I need to make other excuses for why I keep the commandments. My, like I'm going to keep the commandments because it points my soul to him. Yeah. And I think there's something almost like you you can almost find some teachings of Jesus that are pretty harsh against people who are keeping commandments for other intentions throughout the New Testament. He's just like, listen, um, what's interesting is Jesus was 100% obedient. And so were some of like the scribes and Pharisees of his day. And you're just kind of like, that's really interesting that you are both really, really obedient And yet we've kind of made this group bad guys. And you're like, but why? But they're like super They're doing everything right. Right. And Jesus is like, "Ah, yeah, but the intention is what's really, really important here about this. And I think what you just taught is a really powerful discussion and a really powerful principle that if you are separating commandments from 
like relationship and love of God, they will lose their power. If they are not for the intention of love. He will stop being a father and start being a dictator. Right, right. And That's what you're... You can re-enthrone commandment keeping with classes, with kids, and with yourself, mm. and you will connect it to love of the father, trust of the father, and of the son. And I'm not sure that I've ever, like, I'm sure that I have, but this verse, I don't know the last time that I read a verse that explained it so clearly mm -hmm. and so impactfully, mm -hmm. but it's just like, okay, look, this is why we kept the commandments because it points our souls to him. It's so simple. Right. It's one sentence. Yeah. And he keeps going through, like, I think this whole chapter, he does that with so many other things because by the time you get to verse six, um, and also you just need to read verse five and you should study it because it talks about Abraham and Isaac. And I think that is also a really cool connection mm -hmm. to like pointing our souls. And don't worry, I won't like waste, like we won't like talk about it for 45 minutes. So you just want to study that and it's going to be so good. But in verse number six, I think it's so cool because I think so simply he's going to give you the purpose of scripture as well. And he's going to say, listen, wherefore we search the prophets and we have many revelations and the prophet and the spirit of prophecy and having all these witnesses, we obtain a hope and our faith becomes unshaken. You wonder why we have general conference and why we have scripture. Oh, he's like, listen, because you're going to need it for hope. You are going to need to read the stories of people who have gone through things like you and realize that God showed up for them so he will show up for you. You need to read that because it will make your faith unshaken. When everyone else is trying to rock you, go to the scripture, that will help. And then I think he's going to go through in verse can, seven. Can oh. I just throw this in? Because yeah. I think I feel like I would almost take five and six as a rule of thumb for any time I teach or speak in church. Mm. Uh, those three things. One, here's my intention. One, point souls to him, first and foremost. Two, um, help people obtain hope. And three, encourage their faith. Right? If I took that as like my intention for any time I taught, shared a lesson, taught a lesson, spoke, whatever, those three things, I just, I've never like, I just, I love maybe pulling those out as like, oh, here's my intention. It's so here's simple. Your, yeah. Yeah. Every bishop in the whole church could take five and six and say, here is your intention yep. when you speak. This One, is your goal. two, three. These strings right here. Simple. Um, in verse number seven, I think he's going to give you the purpose of weaknesses. Yeah, and, let, and let, not, that's not on the list. Number, like, that's oh, not yeah. Like, yeah <laughs> don't do that. Don't, don't go, do that. Don't go your... seven. Because you could look at the seven. It's like the Lord God has a job of showing people. <laughs> that's not yours. That's not yours. That's his. I'm like, simple. And he told you. He told you whose job this is. Um, and he's going to say, listen, he's going to show you weakness, not to make you feel less than, not to make you feel incapable, but to show you that it is by his grace and his great condescensions unto the children of men that we have the power to do these things. He's going to give you weaknesses. He's going to show you your mess ups and your slip ups. And he's going to say, look, you could be better here. Not because he wants to say like you're doing a terrible job, but because he's going to say, when you realize those things, you are going to see Jesus show up in your story. Mm -hmm. When you look at your weakness, you will see him close by. So don't you forget about that. Don't miss that because you're not like your weakness is so that you can get to know Jesus better. Amen. That's simple. Amen. And then there's so many other good things, but I just think like in verse number 13, something else that we're so good at overcomplicating is the spirit. And I think he gives like this like tiny one verse sermon about like, you wonder what the purpose of the spirit is. Do not overcomplicate it. The spirit speaks the truth and he, um, and he doesn't lie. Anything the spirit says, it's not going to be a lie. He will tell you things as they really are. He will tell you things as they will be, and he will speak it to you plainly to save your soul. That's it. When you wonder what the job of the spirit is, that is what it is. And I love that we have a spirit that will tell you things as they really are. When you are unsure what's happening in your life right now, he will tell you. But when you need truth about the future, the spirit is capable of that as well. Don't overcomplicate him. That is it. That is his job. He will help you. And it's so interesting because... It ends verse number 14 and it's going to say, listen, the Jews were a stiff naked people and they despised the words of plainness and killed the prophets and sought for things which they could not understand. That was the problem. They killed the prophets. They were so angry about the plain and simpleness of the gospel of the words that they tried to find more things. They were like, listen, we like, I like need to get all, like, I just think that's such an interesting line. They sought for things which could not be understood. They were seeking for things that were like, that were worthless. They was just like, why are you even doing that? It's not worth your time. 
and they looked beyond the mark. And I love that this entire chapter is showing you the mark. He's going to say, listen, don't overcomplicate things. Don't overthink it. Don't overlook it. Just focus on the real purpose and intent. And it's just always him. Right. Yeah. And it just kind of comes back to that when that lawyer came asking Jesus, you know, for, for, I don't know what he was seeking for. I don't know what he was wanting to have a conversation about. I don't know what he was trying to trip up Jesus on, you know. I don't know what, where he was just like, hey, of all the 613 laws, which one is the, which one's the most important? Which one, like, and I just, Jesus' simple answer is what this lesson has been today. Mm -hmm. Love God with all your heart, with all your might, with all your mind, with all your strength. Live vertically. And number two, love people. Take care of them. Look out for each other. Make them the focus of your heart and life. On this hangs everything else. It is, it's that simple. Hmm. So here we go. Yeah. The people business. People business. All right, y'all. See you for Jacob 5 next week, which is so good. Get excited. I just got the hiccups. I'm so excited. <laughs>